Good. All right, so first off the bat, uh, uh, I, along with every single analyst, economist and forecaster out there, owe you all a huge apology. And we do. Um, we got the election wrong. <laughs> uh, every single one of us. And so because of that, those of you who know me well, I, mean, I, I tend to spend a lot of time digging into data. And so in order for me to come up with forecasts, what's the most important thing for me to do is I need quantifiable and qualifiable information. Unfortunately, that takes a little bit more than a 140-character tweet. Um, so every forecaster now needs these things a lot because it's become remarkably difficult to try and figure out what's going to be going on uh, in, in the future. Um, but I'm not here to talk about nationally. I'm here to talk about what's going on locally. Um, the economy. Woohoo! We are rocking. Uh, and we really are on all cinders. Say we're doing well would be an understatement. I've been travelling around a lot. In fact, I was in, in Coeur d'Alene and Spokane giving speeches there for Windermere the last couple of days. Hey, you think it's cold here? <laughs> you don't know cold, believe me. Um, and, and everyone is looking to the northwest and everyone's looking to Seattle and saying, oh, why can't we be more like you? And even in California and in Oregon, people are saying, we want to be like Seattle. And especially on the East Coast as well. So are we doing well? We're doing remarkably well. And because of that, it's translating through to the real estate market uh, and your businesses, which are clearly flourishing. Uh, and certainly, as Matt said uh, a bit earlier on. So we talk about employment growth. That's my forecast for, for this, actually this year now. Uh, Two and a half percent statewide. Good number. You can clearly see the West Coast is outperforming. Uh, we're doing a lot better, certainly, than the middle part of the country, better so than the East Coast. And if you look at, actually, the areas or the states where Windermere has a presence, we're doing remarkably well. We really don't care about New Mexico. They just kind of plod along. Um, but we are expanding and we are growing. And locally, it's my forecast through 2017, we are generating an incredible number of jobs. And that is not going to stop. It will slow down a little bit. And the reason why it's going to slow down is the fact that everyone that wants to work is working. And they're doing remarkably well at it. So we would now rely on population growth and creation of households uh, to start seeing improvement in that number. But it is still a remarkably buoyant, remarkably bullish, and actually from a historic perspective, very substantial number. So employment through the course of this year, not going to drop. We're going to be growing a tad slower but it is still going to be quite remarkable growth. And if you compare us to everywhere else, our other metro areas, I mean, Boise, is, Boise is doing well, but Boise is tiny. And um, because it's only 400,000 jobs, uh, they can actually have one company move in and all of a sudden they go to the top of the list. So, um, but we are growing compared to all West Coast markets. We're certainly at the top. And that, again, it is not going to change. And the metro areas within the state, similar thing. I mean, you've got, uh, sorry, Spokane's doing well. For some reason, Wenatchee is going gangbusters. Um, but there again, Wenatchee has 34,000 jobs. So coffee shop opens, 6% employment growth. So, uh, so, so we are doing, uh, again, very, very well. What are the jobs we're getting? We lost a lot of jobs through a recession, a remarkably large number. So many of them come, have come back, but not in every single sector. The top of the list there is interesting in terms of growth information. Thank you, Amazonians. They and associated companies are growing like weeds. And they're a little bit late coming back to the market. They're expanding. Therefore, because of that, retail tends to expand. Because of that, leisure, i.e. hotels, tend to expand. And we're under construction on a ridiculously large number of hotel rooms right now. And those tend to be a precursor for economic growth. As hoteliers believe you're going to get people who are going to come in here for business and not just for the fact they're coming to sit on the great wheel in Seattle. So, but we are still seeing some contraction. Manufacturing is still low, below or lower. Financial activities and most importantly, construction. And that is very, very important. And it applies to your businesses as well. Because if we haven't got the construction employment growth that we expect to see, that means people that are working in that business are being paid more. And that's great for them, not great for the end user of the house that they want to buy, which has now gone up by 20%, just to compensate for how much more developers have to pay their subcontractors. We haven't got enough electricians. We haven't got enough carpenters. We haven't got enough plumbers. See, no one wants to go to vocational school. We need these people. Housing is, a, an, an, I call it, an organic good. We'll always need it. We always have. But right now, it's not one of the STEM subjects. Therefore, no one's interested in making 
about $150,000 a year as a plumber. Now, that's kind of scary. So that is actually going to push prices up, but also means from new construction standpoint, you're going to see not as many new homes built because of cost. And that then puts pressure on the resale markets. That could be actually be a good thing. So we look at growth, said uh, aerospace, aerospace with Boeing. Um, I'm actually speaking in Bellingham uh, next week and, and Everett. Uh, not going to be a growth model through the course of the next couple of years. That doesn't necessarily concern me. Anytime you see a contraction, and there's a reason for that contraction. It's essentially, Airbus is undercutting them in price. And because of that, they're having to lay off people. They'll start expanding again in 2018 with the uh, 777 MAX. When that comes out, that will start, we'll see employment growth, but not until then. Um, but in general, doing pretty well. If more people coming in than coming out, he says, and I'm pressing buttons. And there, here we go. All right, unemployment, remarkably good. Again, if you want a job, you can find a job. What's important about that when we hit, what, 4% unemployment? is the fact that we'll start seeing wages go up because people want to still be employed. Well, people obviously want to be employed, but employers want to be kept. Uh, they want to keep their staff. And therefore, that means is they're having to pay their staff more, which is something they haven't seen in years. Uh, I speak to various groups outside of Windermere, uh, and I'm telling the, the partners and the CA, CEOs and the CFOs of these companies, you know what, you're going to have to start paying a bit more. They hate that thought. They really do. Like, why? So well, you haven't increased pay for seven years. You kind of have to. And so it's actually going to be a good thing. That, again, obviously drives the economy and drives housing. We're going to see fairly substantial growth in salaries through the course of, of this year as well, purely based upon the fact remarkably low unemployment. And if we seasonally adjust it, uh, which I do, which the state doesn't by, by county, again, very, very positive, both here as well as up in Snohomish County as well. So even Snohomish County is doing pretty well, less so down in Pierce County. And in general, this applies to me or it suggests to me full employment, full employment, that's going to be a good thing. So talking about King County, kind of interesting. Uh, I know you may have seen this slide before. So how many people are coming here? So what we do is you look at actually kind of real growth. What real growth is, you take the amount of people born and you subtract the amount of people that die. What is interesting about this chart actually is that the recession hit and we had more babies. Um, is it kind of counterintuitive? Right? Recessions have less babies. No, we had nothing better to do. So um, we had more kids. Subtract from that people, people that are dying, uh, which is essentially about half. That gives you your, your real net, which is about anywhere between 10 and 15,000 people more every year than the year before. Does that make sense? All right. Well, then you have to add on to that people moving here from somewhere else. And it adds on that many. It adds another 40,000 people in King County in 2016. A remarkably large number. And here's the problem with it. We haven't got enough housing for everyone. And we can't. There's no more land. And this is a big argument, big issue that I, I personally have at the state level is, you know, we, we're not going to build out into Elliott Bay. Sorry, not, not going to happen. And so because of that, we haven't got enough land. We also have very restrictive growth policies. That, well, those two things combined push home prices higher. And a lot more people are coming here. When you see migration from other areas, and our, where people come from to, to Seattle, they come from California. Who, I mean, California has a slowdown. They have no compunction at all. Jump in their car, move to Seattle. Hey, it's what they do. Uh, Oregon and Texas are the three, by far the three major, major net migration markets uh, to Seattle. So a lot of people coming here, and they tend to migrate towards markets that are doing well. And that is very unlikely to change. As I said, we've become the poster child for economic growth, certainly on the West Coast. I was speaking to a CEO of a technology company in uh, Silicon Valley a couple of weeks ago, and he told me almost half of his staff, if they could, would choose to move to Seattle from Silicon Valley. Because they believe the housing prices are so cheap <laughs> that how can you lose? And that to a degree is true. You think about housing, look at the Bay Area. Median home price last month was $1.45 million. That was the median. And um, housing affordability there, because of that, 13% of households in the Bay Area can afford to buy somewhere. Median income is about $110,000 a year. You need to be making $247,000 a year to afford to buy a house. Is the issue there? Yep. That's why they're saying I-5 goes north. And they're going to be hitting it. Uh, if they could. And so I expect to see actually a lot more technology companies start looking here 
or are looking to further expand their presence here. That's going to be remarkably buoyant for our, our housing market, no doubt about it. And I said, here's diversity. I mentioned about the fact that Boeing and how they are not quite as important now, and they're not. But we've diversified, and that's a great thing, because it means you don't go the direction of one specific company. The Boeing bust of 1972 led to more people moving out of our region than moving in in 73. So last year that happened. And the person put the, uh, the poster on I-5. Last person to leave Seattle turned the lights out. That was a Windermere broker. No, I'm serious, it really was. Uh, at least according to John Jacoby, it was. Um, so we're diversified. Now, what does that diversification mean to us? Well, this is kind of fascinating. So I think about companies that are growing. Yeah, but are people going to stay there forever? No, they're not. And here's what I'm seeing. If you take the so blue line at the bottom is uh, employment at Microsoft over time. And the companies that are listed there are ones that were created from people that used to work for Microsoft. So it is the Zillow's, Intellectual Ventures, Gates Financial, obviously important, Valve, Expedia. These are all spin-offs from Microsoft. But then if you look at the red line, that's Amazon.com's employment, who, by the way, employed 250,000 full-time employees. Um, that's obviously not in Seattle, that's worldwide. But in Seattle, my calculation right now is that if they build out everything they're going to be building out, we'll see over 55,000 uh, Amazonians in that marketplace. So they employ more MBAs than any other company in the world. And you can't tell me those people are going to stay there at Amazon.com forever, because they won't. So if you see these kind of spin-offs from Microsoft, what kind of spin-offs will you see from Amazon? I would suggest it's going to be a lot. Not only is it going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot of companies that are going to choose Seattle. I work at UW, well, I work at UW, I teach at UW, and my graduate students, I say to them all the time, like, where are you going to go when you graduate? You're going to go to Boston, Chicago, New York? Yeah, nope, Seattle. Like, no, 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 grasshopper, come on, out of here, leave. <laughs> um, but they have no interest in leaving. They are going to stay here. And so is that going to help our economy? Yeah, it is. So we are remarkably fortunate. Watch this, because we are going to start seeing more and more spin-offs coming out of companies like these. You're just those companies listed there, it's hard to see, but it's about 25,000 employees in just those selected. And that's not every company uh, that's spun out of Microsoft. So it really is quite remarkable. And if you think about it, we have three of the wealthiest 10 people in the planet living within spitting distance of here. Is that going to be beneficial to our area? You betcha. Look, the Gates Foundation is a great example of that. I started doing work with the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates Sr. a long time ago. He had four employees. They've now got 1,200 employees, charged with giving away $2.5 billion a year, forever. And that creates businesses around them. So you're going to see this growth. And it's, it really is quite remarkable. And we are remarkably fortunate uh, because of it. So from an economic perspective, what do I think is going on? Crystal ball here, OK. Um, all right, employment growth. We will continue to expand. Shy of 3% this year, still a very valid, very substantial number, one we cannot complain about in any way, shape, or form. Um, tech growth. The growth now is funny. I, mean, I live in Queen Anne, and obviously my offices are in Sandpoint. I, I hate Mercer. Mercer Street sucks. They said it, they got it right, right? Yet, yeah, no, they haven't. Um, and because of that, I'm driving down Mercer uh, Street to get onto I-5 to come here this morning. I'm seeing development going on because you've got Google's new campus. Uh, it's going ahead right now. You're seeing Facebook expanding there. And fairly shortly, there'll be an announcement of Apple taking up a huge uh, amount of space. Um, so Appleites are going to be coming here as well, who currently aren't, but they're going to be here. And they'll be here in droves. So we're going to see that growth. That is unlikely. Uh, to go away, uh, uh, whatever our, our incoming president might think he wants to do with technology, um, it's not going to go away. So that's going to be a very, very positive thing. Uh, income growth. We are going to be making more money as a function of remarkably low unemployment and a very tight market. And companies moving in here wanting to employ the best, they're going to have to start paying. So we're going to see about 4.5% income growth in 2017. A very solid, substantial number top 10% of the country, uh, I would suggest. So that's going to be a good thing as well. And he says, uh, yeah, when I say the economy should do well uh, in 2017, I'm going to go back to the tweet thing. Um, you know, it's funny, I used to wake up and check the, check the news in the morning. Now I wake up and I check Twitter. Um, like, what, what has he said so far? Um, 
it, and it should. But obviously, I think ultimately that this obviously it's the great unknown. All things be equal. However, even if potentially bad things may happen down the road, it won't be in 2017 because there's about a year spread between ongoing rhetoric and policy. So nothing immediate, hopefully, uh, will, will have an effect nationally speaking. And ultimately, if we start seeing infrastructure spending, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that is going to be a good thing. Because it is going to create employment, generally speaking, in the middle part of the country. So that's good. The economy's going to do well. Now, housing. Housing market. This is why we're here to discuss it. Um, <laughs> quite remarkable. So what I did here, look at listings. This is King County. Look at listings. Look at sales. Um, and I seasonally adjusted. Otherwise, you'd see these wickedly uh, wild swings. But seasonally adjusted, we sold more homes in December than there were listings. You say you can't do that, right? but you actually you can. Um, but does it mean it's a balanced market? Oh, boy, no. And is it likely to become a balanced market in 2017? Sorry, guys, it's not. We are still going to have more buyers than we have sellers. So those of you that represent sellers, sorry, wrong, you represent buyers in the marketplace who are, I'm sure, clearly beating you up saying, well, I want to buy somewhere. You're not showing me anywhere to buy. It's your fault. And that's not my fault. There's nothing on the market. Sorry. And that is, and that, is that going to change? Uh, I just don't see it happening anytime soon, unfortunately. So it is going to remain very, very tight, certainly through the course uh, of this year. And because we've seen that tightness, median sales price now of single-family homes in the, the, the county uh, have obviously at all matched all-time highs. Um, December, summer came out, which essentially matched the month before but it is still has been a remarkable run. And a run, again, which I don't think is likely to stop, so not stop, uh, through the course of this year. So are we going to continue to see home price growth? Yes, we absolutely will. How much? I'll get to that in a second. So, um, historically speaking, the average in the county, we dropped down by 36%, no big deal there, jumped up by almost 80% in value between the low and where we are today. But the long-term average is just over 5%. Are we going to get back to that 5% figure? Yes. Are we going to do it this year? Nope. It will be higher than that, clearly. So, but do I want it to remain at 8, 9, 10, 12%? No, I don't. I really do not like markets which increase in value by that level, by that amount. Why? Well, we're not making that much more money every year to service that debt. And so because of that, those are markets which are unsustainable. So will we end up reverting back to that 5 5.5%? Five As a county, I would say yes. But it's going to be a ways off right now uh, because the fact the market is going to remain incredibly tight. But we've done remarkably well. Um, the problem is, in doing well, is housing affordability. And this is where I have a big problem uh, at the state level. And I spend a lot of time uh, down in Olympia uh, arguing with senators on how we need to fix this and why we need to fix this. Because it is housing affordability. King County is marginally just by the skin of its teeth affordable. Why is it affordable? Just because of interest rates. But it's very, very close. However, it has never, ever, ever been affordable for a first-time buyer. Now, at some point, you're going to find companies who are thinking about expanding here, saying, well, how much do I have to pay my staff? The biggest component of that is cost of living. If it gets too expensive, they're going to say, Seattle or Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. They can do that. Those decisions can be made. If we want to remain competitive, we need to figure that out. There's no question about it. Because permits, we're not seeing new construction activity take off. Builders are not building as much as we would like them to. Why? Bigger builders are being told by their own internal finance groups, we went over our, our skis before the recession. We're not going to do it again. And secondly, why flood the market when you can trickle feed it and see prices go up? That's very much the case. So building permits are still down dramatically. Price trends on the east side doing very, very well. Um, and it's funny is that Matt mentioned uh, a slight drop off in, uh, in transactions uh, for you guys. Modestly, it looks the same if you look at the market in general. And that is a supply-driven issue. Because of that, you're seeing price growth really doing remarkably well. And for new construction, again, we have seen a drop off, fairly dramatic one, over the last three years. So when you normally see a market that's bullish, that's buoyant, builders start building, they haven't been, pressures the resale marketplace and shows resale prices going up by more than you like to expect. Uh, and resale listing inventory is quite ridiculous. And again, we adjust it uh, for seasonality. Very, very, very low level of listings in the marketplace. Um, and new construction, again, hasn't come back. And new construction will unlikely 
come back through the course of this year. So we break down the, the market, the east side market. It's kind of interesting. You see his home price growth, single family. Uh, the reason why West Bellevue is low because it is remarkably expensive. Uh, and therefore, that can happen. Uh, so what you tend to see in general is we have this drive to buy mentality. We want to live closer to where we work. There's a value to our time. And we will pay more to live closer to where we, where we work. That's why God created Marysville. Um, <laughs> no, and, and, and it really is. I love Marysville. It's a great place. Uh, um, but everyone lives there because it's a bedroom community. No one works there. But it is cheap. And that's where people can live and then have that enviable two and a half hour drive south to Seattle. And it's funny, I was on a plane going to, uh, to uh, Spokane uh, yesterday, flying back from Spokane. People are actually commuting from Spokane to Seattle. So you can buy a house there for about 200 grand. And they'll commute. And actually, now Alaska will give you a deal if you buy 20 tickets at a time. You get a 40% discount on your, your flight costs. People are commuting from Clay Ellum. So it's interesting. I could talk about that all day, but I won't. So, um, list the activity. Again, I'm going backwards, here we are. So, locally, we'll see about, and again, this is for the market, more generalised market, about 8% price growth. Now, select sub-markets obviously will be higher than that. This is a slight 2 percentage point come down from where we expected it to be. Um, why is that the case? You start seeing there, interest rates increasing faster than I had anticipated. So, 30-year fixed mortgage rates will end this year at about 4.6% on average for a 30 year. That's higher than I had thought. Why? Because we expect to see inflation. Now, and the last thing the bond market likes is inflation. It hates inflation because you have to see bond yields increase. That affects mortgage rates. So when you start seeing deficit spending uh, and inflation kicking in, mortgage rates will go up. It's still a fairly modest increase, but they are going to go up. And that is going to act as a bit of an anchor on price growth. I'm all good with that. I, I really, really am. Um, proximity to Bellevue, yeah. I remember talking to the CEO of Symmetra Financial in 1999 when they just decided to make Bellevue its corporate headquarters. And I'm like, Bellevue, why? It was 1999, so think about it. Um, and he said, all I did was triangulate the location of where all our staff live. We wanted to be close to where our staff are. And they were, they were really the genesis of urban growth. So are we going to see that continue? Yeah, Bellevue as an autonomous business centre will continue to grow. Kemper Freeman or no Kemper Freeman, that will happen. Uh, and they are going to start attracting businesses who really don't care now if they're in Bellevue or if they're in Seattle. The distinction isn't there that it used to be. Unless you're a law firm, they're all snotty that way. They're like, well, Bellevue, yeah, but I've got to have an office in Seattle as well. But Xing them out, yeah, it's going to do remarkably well. Um, supply, yeah, sorry, we're not going to see any big push in, on the supply side. That's the problem in terms of just total activity. We're not going to be where we want it to be. Are we going to get back up to very reasonable levels anytime soon? I would probably say that's unlikely as well. Um, I think we've got one or two condo projects, but it won't be a lot. One or two, well, one certainly should happen, uh, possibly uh, 2017 in, in Bellevue. A couple more maybe in Seattle, but that's essentially it. Um, yeah, you'll be above average through the course of this year. Nothing that I'm seeing right now suggests anything but a buyer's market, sorry, a seller's market with above average price growth, increased demand driven by job growth. 2017 is going to be a year where you guys are going to rock. Uh, I have no doubt about it. And I would, in fact, it was the opposite. One of these years, I will stand up here and say, buy canned goods, a gun, and move to Montana. Um, but it is not this year. <laughs> so with that, um, you've been very gracious with your time. Uh, have a fantastic 2017. And I look forward to seeing you next year.